Hey everybody, Steve Kozar here. Earlier this year, I did this interview with Brian Auden from the Apologetics 315 podcast. We had such a good conversation that I invited him to do an interview with me for my channel, and that's what you're about to see. This is a really interesting interview. Brian has a lot of really good things to say for people coming out of the NAR or the hyper-charismatic movement, and I think you'll really find this useful and encouraging. So please listen to the whole thing. Thanks so much. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this Messed Up Church interview. I'm Steve Kozar, and I'm talking to my new friend, Brian. How do, you know what? Your last name is Outen or Auten? Auten. Auten. That's what I thought, but I was like, no, maybe it's Outen. I can't remember. Okay. So, Brian, you are the the guy in charge of a wonderful podcast. Tell us about it. Well, th thanks, Steve. It's great to be on your program here. And uh, I run the Apologetics 315 podcast with my co-host, Chad Gross. And the purpose of that podcast is to interview scholars and uh, theologians and apologists, historians, um, authors about the topics surrounding defending the faith, um, giving good reasons for why we believe what we believe. And I've uh, been doing that since about 2008 or nine, and uh, took a little hiatus here and there. Huh. But generally, uh, it's it's a lot of fun. We release podcasts weekly, and um, I think it's a great resource. It is a great resource. I, I got to tell you, you know, uh, the reason why we know each other is because you contacted me so that I could be on your show, which I did just a little over a month ago. And I played it for my wife, and she said that, that is the best interview you've ever done. That guy really is good. You you really do a professional job. So Thank I you. really do recommend people to uh, to check out this podcast, especially if you want to be stronger in your faith and the issue of apologetics, which is actually a, a topic I love. I wish I could talk about it more, but you know, I, I wind up making these crazy videos about Kenneth Copeland and Todd White and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. But there's a need for that. So when we talked during that podcast, I think it was after we got off uh, the recording phase, you told me a little bit about your background and how closely affiliated you used to be with the New Apostolic Reformation. And I was like, wow. And so I yeah. thought, I want to have you on my show. So that's why you're here today. Well, thanks for the invite. I, I um, 20 years ago, I didn't really know anything about apologetics. And coming out of churches that were strongly NAR, and that sort of background is what caused me to find apologetics. Um, and hmm. maybe we'll get into that experience a little bit, I'm sure. But um, in a quick nutshell, the thing that the reason I'm doing apologetics is because the next Sunday after I left the church that I had to get out of, <laughs> uh, I went to a church and everything in my mind, it was a different church. And, and I thought everything in my mind was saying, I still believe in God. I still believe in God. I can't deny that. But why should I trust the Bible? And that first service hmm. that I went to, there happened to be a panel of uh, Christian apologists talking about why you can trust the Bible and how it's been, um, you know, preserved and translated accurately and what reasons we have to believe it's authoritative for us today. Because I got to the point the week before where I could trust no one anymore. I could uh i thought i can't trust men and therefore why should i even trust the bible because these men were preaching me the bible and um right. everything is turned upside down and so from that point i thought wow thank you god uh and i found um different sources of information about hermeneutics and you know, proper interpretation of scripture and steve it was like wow there's actually some good rules to follow when you're using the scripture. You can't make it say anything you want it to mean. And uh, that's, yeah. it was, it was like, wow, you know, there's principles yeah. for judging whether or not someone's using the scripture right. And they're pretty simple and straightforward. And so that would begin a shift because I felt um, like now I can engage my reason where the background I had been in before with, which was a lot of new apostolic reformation sorts of teachings and we're a faith and frankly hyper charismania in a way uh if you questioned anything if you wanted to know the reason for anything then you're being brainy you're being a, a pharisee being a naysayer uh, labels were slapped on and you were told to submit and come under authority and you're being rebellious 
And so it was so refreshing to be able to say, oh, I can ask questions now. I can reason now. I can understand why. I can, I can read the Bible for myself and, and have it be an authority to judge what I'm hearing around me. And so it was very uh, uh, refreshing. And um, I just thought, well, I just want to keep studying because it's been so reinvigorating to my faith to find an uh, intellectual side of faith. Not to say that I've ditched any sort of emotion. We're all emotional, and even an yeah. intellectual folks are driven by emotion and what they engage in intellectually. Um, but my faith wasn't founded on experience anymore. It was like, no, I, I can trust that Christianity is true on historical reasons. Jesus rose from the dead. I can trust that the Bible is is a good authority for, in my life and have reasons to believe it's been uh, accurately translated and preserved and and that I there are tools for good interpretation versus making it say whatever you want, you know? Yeah, th th there's so much good stuff you just said right there. I think the idea of you're either this Christian on one side that says we we have to disengage from our intellect, our brain is our enemy, and then the other side says no, Everything is coming from our brain. You know, Christianity mm -hmm. is purely an intellectual exercise. Obviously, this is a false dichotomy. Nobody actually says that Christianity is a intellectual exercise only. Mm -hmm. And I think a really useful way to say it is that God did give us our brains. We are to worship him with our, with our brains as well as our feelings. Mm -hmm. And we can take our intellect as far as it will go and use it as much as we can, knowing that there's a point where we've bumped up against something which is, you know, yeah. God being infinite and holy, and we are not. So no one's saying that we're going to have everything figured out completely and that we're going to actually be able to explain God. Mm -hmm. But we can explain as much as he has explained to us in his word, and we can do that using our brains. Yeah. And it's actually very refreshing. And, man, even what you just said about how you were being told to submit to authority— shows the very kind of controlling cult-like tendencies that develop when you tell people that their brain is the problem. Mm, yeah. Or, or that it's all about the heart and not about... So as, as soon as somebody does what you just said, it's, you know, I, I've got some questions that I'm, I'm really confused about. Can, can you explain this to me? And they're like, no, I, how dare you ask me to explain something? That's a bad sign. Yeah. A really bad sign. Yeah. And coming from any place, not uh -huh. just some hyper-charismatic, but from any particular place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there's a great book by uh, J.P. Moreland called Love Your God With All Your Mind. And in that, he hmm. emphasizes being what he calls a full-orbed Christian. That, you know, uh, your, love your Lord God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, your, your mind. And he really uh, emphasizes the, the intellectual engagement with Christianity. How study is a discipline, but it's, it's a spiritual discipline. And and how God has created us to have uh, intellectual engagement with with our faith, and not just to check our mind at the door. And you know, we're we're called to study to show ourselves approved, and and that sort of thing. So that that mm -hmm. was a great influence on me as well to free me up from having to work some spiritual <laughs> formulas to get a result, a spiritual result. You know. Um, sort of uh, the mentality this, that I picked up through my earlier church experiences were um, that, you know, if you pray harder, you'll get a greater result. If you pray longer and louder mm -hmm. and more intense, you'll get a greater result. Um, you know, it was a real performance mentality where um, you, you got in what you put out and it was all, all about putting your emotion behind your prayer and pray from your spirit and, you know, stir yourself up and, uh, you know, growl if you need to and scream and shout and travail if you need to. And, um, you know, for people who are not familiar with that sort of environment, it's intense and, but it becomes the norm when you're in it and everybody around you is doing it and there's pressure to conform to that. And if everybody's yes. doing it must be right. Oh, nothing's mm -hmm. happening. Let's do it stronger. And, uh, so yeah, yeah, it's a it's a real hamster wheel experience. <laughs> it's like uh, there's a guy digging this hole, and he just keeps 
going deeper and deeper. And he's saying, if I can just dig a little bit further, I'm going to get out of this thing. Just let me keep going. And, and you know, you, no, you got to stop and go the other direction sometimes. You know, the other thing that happened they, when I came out of <clears throat> uh, my church experience with the NAR, and we'll, we'll get into that, I'm sure. Uh, but the biggest thing was, wow, now I understand grace. I don't need mm. to do anything. Uh, mm -hmm. I can rest in the Lord. I don't have to please a man. I don't have to perform for everyone around me. I don't have to try to be something I'm not. I don't have to hide my struggles. I don't have to do anything. I, and grace didn't make sense. Um, no, I didn't have, like, maybe if you'd call it a revelation <laughs> of grace, like I did coming out of it, because, um, you know, when I started listening to certain preaching that was more like verse by verse and talking about the gospel instead of what God's going to take you to the next level and, you know, dunamis power mm -hmm. and, you know, miracles and this is your season. Uh, then it was like, no, the gospel, um, Christ died for you. He paid the price for your sins. You are no longer under the, you know, that penalty is not going to fall on you. It's fallen on him and you were crucified with Christ. And you're going to live with him. Mm -hmm. His righteousness is imparted to you. And now you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You're in Christ now. And there is no condemnation for you. And uh, wow, what? <laughs> that's the good news, you know, uh, that I don't have to do anything because Christ did everything. And uh, yeah. I don't need to perform. I'm going to live my life <laughs> in humble thankful appreciation and worship and that's my service is going to be that it's not going to be in order to attain that or to again live in a fear of man and and what does the apostle think of me uh, is the apostle pleased um you know am i obeying god why am i not pr prophesying like the people around me um why does it why am I not getting the big old breakthroughs that I've been promised? Everyone around me is pushing in for financial blessings and, uh, you know, giving big offerings and having faith for new cars and, um, you know, believing God for this and that. And everything uh, <laughs> was just, like I say, hamster wheel of striving and burden placed on your back mm -hmm. to go to the next church experience. God's going to do something powerful tonight. God's going to do something powerful this morning. God is going to give you your new breakthrough in this meeting. Don't miss this conference coming up because so-and-so is going to be there. They are one of the biggest prophetic voices in the nation. They've been to 23 countries. Oh, make sure to bring your offering. We're going to have a special seed faith offering. And if you give right now, oh, you know what? The Lord is telling me. Write a check for $1,111. Now, if you can't write that, make it for $111. And if you can't do that, make it for $11. But God's going to bless you in response to your faith. Because 11 is the number of fill in the blank. You know, I can mm -hmm. talk all of that talk. I can prophesy right now to you in the way I've heard it a thousand times about your next level and about what God's going to do with your art. Steve, Steve's going to use your art to reach <laughs> the nations. And you know what? I even hear him saying, fill in the blank. Um, and you can ask chat GPT and they'll give you the same thing because they're, it's a recycling. I don't mean mm -hmm. to be offensive, but think about, um, I would ask the listeners to think about what is the, what is the thing you're looking forward to when you're going to church? Because at that time I was striving for, the next experience, the next buzz, the next preacher to run across the stage. How many people fell down? Uh, you know, mm -hmm. what was the word for this next season we're in? What is this new series? What sort of graphics are we going to use for this next conference? You know, how can we hype this up? Now, I'm not saying that everyone who's in a church that... Um, you know, would call itself or not call itself NAR. And, and that, that's a sort of a nebulous term that we, we use for, for categorizing things, <laughs> you know, for painting with a broad brush. Um, but if, 
what I'm describing is a church environment that doesn't have Christ and the gospel at the center, that doesn't have expository preaching or understanding and teaching people to understand the Word of God and how they can apply it to their life. What I'm describing is a church environment where experience trumps understanding. Experience is sought more than wisdom. Um, mm-hmm. What can I get? What blessing does the Lord have for me? What purpose does the Lord have for me? What am I going to do for God? How is he going to bless me? What's my next season? What's my next breakthrough? Uh, what do I need to do? No, let's let's go worship the Lord and thank him because we're wretched sinners. And uh, there's a big shift um, that comes when you think and stop and think, why why the same thing over and over where I just, you know, it was like I'd look forward to church, but it was because I was looking forward to that excitement. And that hmm. that doesn't never, it never satisfies. But as I said, Steve, when I mm-hmm. came out of that and I, I felt like I understood grace better, the feeling was I don't have to do anything. It's finished. It's done. Mm-hmm. Now, how am I going to thank the Lord? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm not saying that I live there every day. You know, we, we fall into patterns of thinking where we think we have to live up to a standard in order to be spiritual or something. Um, but, you know, that's that's us falling out of a gospel mindset, I think, you know. So th- I know I just rambled yeah. on a bit there, but yeah, uh, that was good. Uh, you can guide me a little good. bit more. <laughs> I, I, I was thinking about Martin Luther created this uh, little catchphrase of categories, one being the theology of glory and the other being the theology of the cross. <clears throat> and I bring this up in my channel every once in a while because I, I found it super helpful. The theology of glory is what you were just describing, where it's all about the next big thing, whether it's the thing that I'm going to do or it's the thing that my church is going to do. Or it's even the just kind of this living vicariously through the famous guy who's going to be coming to the conference and I get to go sit in a room and listen to him. Now I'm closer to the famous guy. Here, There's always this thing that's going to happen as opposed to talking about the thing that already did happen, which is what Christ did on the cross. Mm-hmm. So there's a focus about the glory that you're trying to get for yourself and your church or your group versus theology of the cross says, what if God wants me to suffer? Mm-hmm. What if God's plan for me is not to have any glory for myself at all, but in fact, what if God wants me to suffer as it actually seems pretty clear he does in many cases, mm-hmm. especially when we read the story of the New Testament church. There's not a lot of glory there. There's a little moment here and there, and all the glory that's happening, you know, especially if you talk about the book of Acts, we might have a book of Acts-style church, really? Are you sure? Because I don't know if you read the whole thing, because it wasn't real pretty a lot of the times. Yeah. You know, the, so the theology of the cross is this idea that I, I will always bend my will to Christ. I will always bend my desires and I will I will subdue my desires and say not my will but yours. And if that means I have to suffer and die, that's that's fine. That that should be what we expect or that's what we expect could happen as opposed to you know the the breakthrough is right around the corner. Oh. Yeah. I mean, it just wears people out. Yeah. And it works for a while because you're, you know, who doesn't want to have better things in life? Who doesn't want to be more successful or more whatever. And then the disappointment factor is gigantic. You know, when you get that nagging in the back of your mind that, you know, this guy's telling me about this thing that's supposed to happen, but it sounds exactly like the last guy and the guy before that. And in fact, I heard a guy 20 years ago say these same sorts of things and it still hasn't happened. Yeah. That really does kill people's faith. Yeah. So I'm, I'm interested in hearing some of the key points where you, you know, had little light bulbs going off saying, wait a minute, something's not right here. Mm. Well, let's see what comes to mind. Um, when I started, I, I worked at a church in Southern California for six years. And um, it started out just organizing events. And then it turned into directing media and uh, editing video, editing audio, making websites, um, TV programs and that sort of a thing. So I was the media guy and in charge of, um, you know, promoting all the events and making video advertisements. And at the time, it, 
felt like it was cutting edge, you know. Back then, if you edited video, you were cool. But now everybody's doing it on their phone. Um, so <laughs> that doesn't mean anything on my resume anymore, what, you know. What what year are we talking about? Um, 2000 uh, to 2006 sort of time frame. Okay. okay. So, yeah, about 20 years ago, I'm right in the middle of working for a church who's building a big, you know, new building, raising money. Um, and the pastor... <clears throat> whom I used to call his first name when I knew him in Bible college. That's another story. Uh, but, uh, you know, then he became pastor and then he became a doctor of, you know, you know how you can get doctorates by just sort of telling people <laughs> at a mm -hmm. certain institution uh, your experience and yeah. uh, being a coming an honorary doctor. But no one knew what an honorary doctorate was. They just used the doctor. But that doctor... Uh, moniker was not the real goal. It was more of a placeholder for the shift to apostle. And mm. so things didn't start out uh, real NAR, you know, New Apostolic Reformation. And I would just want to interject this. Some people deny the NAR is a thing. What are you talking about? This is the time when C. Peter Wagner wrote the book Churchquake, and it came out while I was at this church. And it was in the book thing. It was almost like required reading. Everyone was talking about the apostolic, the apostolic. It was mentioned in everything. And it got to the point where my wife and I would joke about everything being apostolic. It was kind of like <laughs> saying, uh, now we want the church service to be awesome. Make sure the preaching's awesome. Uh, is this book awesome enough? And you know how silly it would sound if you labeled everything? You know, we have to be more awesome. Well, just plug the word apostolic in there because we, you know, let's talk about the children's church. Um, how can we make this more apostolic? And huh. it became the point where it was a, every conference was apostolic uh, release, apostolic explosion. And so the new apostolic <laughs> reformation was, it is a thing. And that's when it started. Now they've gotten away from maybe right. wanting to use that term, those in that movement. But the idea is still there. The mm -hmm. idea was that, um, wow, in the 80s, God started bringing back the office of the prophet, the restoration of the full fivefold ministry. Mm -hmm. But in the 90s and the 2000s and the new millennium, oh, big deal, new millennium, because God's going to do super things by releasing the apostles back into the earth because they're God's governmental authority to bring the end time revival. So. Mm -hmm. This was a huge deal, and of course, anyone who's an A-type personality running a church in a CEO, you know, authoritarian manner, who has a lot of persuasion and manipulative skills, that's <laughs> pretty much, you could call them an apostle, because mm -hmm. they take charge, they get things done. And so, you know, job descriptions were taught, of, well, here's what the apostles do, here's what the prophets do, here's what their roles look like. Now... The poor teacher was never mentioned. And it was like, oh, the teacher is the nerd who has the chess club and he can maybe, you know, <laughs> teach you something, but we don't need to hear from him. <laughs> you know? Well, he's probably the guy that has like an apologetics podcast or something, <laughs> know. you know. Yes. <laughs> so this was right when the NAR was birthed, when C. Peter Wagner, you know, he did a lot of church, church growth studies and he thought, yeah. hey, you know. Um, the churches that are growing the most are these ones that have a certain structure. Um, some people mm -hmm. call the, the leaders of these networks uh, apostles. So, yeah, you know, this is how God seems to be growing the church in these end, end times. This is a reformation of sorts. This is how God's going to do it. This is the new apostolic reformation. So, Did you read Bill Hammond? I I had only heard of him. I don't think I read too much of that, you know, okay. that we had other assigned reading. <laughs> well, because uh, Wagner actually appealed <clears throat> to the writings of Bill Hammond as oh. foundational, because he was talking about the prophetic gift coming back in the 80s and yeah. 90s. And then C. Peter Wagner said, I'm building on top of that prophetic idea with this new apostle idea. Yeah. I, I, th these people are like uh, in their own fantasy world, to be honest. They're just making stuff up and you can see whatever you want to see if you want to see it bad enough. So they were seeing yeah. this thing happening. They were seeing real movements and, and real trends and 
categories, but C. Peter Wagner is delusional in my mm. estimation. He just he not only did he name the movement as he observed it, he then very um very uh what's the word? I'm one it too. Was very, um, <laughs> Yeah, he's and not only am I one, but I'm a, I'm a leader of this thing uh, that yes. I observed named. Yeah. And now I'm a leader in it. I'm one of the apostles mm-hmm. of this thing. Yeah. It was very uh what's the word I'm looking for? It's convenient. That's the word. Yeah. It's convenient for him. Well, you know, so yeah, I, I I'm I'm really glad you brought that up because what what I wanted to make sure everybody understood mm-hmm. from what you're saying is there was no hesitation to talk about the new apostolic reformation. It was something that you were excited about. It oh, was yeah. something that everyone was if they talked about it, it was like, oh, yeah, it, of course we're part of it. It was we're, like, we're at the cutting edge. We've got it the latest and greatest. greatest. And uh, anyone who wasn't right. embracing this, you know, you're going to get left behind because this is the new move of God. And so everyone was quick. The new, the new wineskins oh, yeah. is probably something oh, you heard, yeah. right? New wineskins? Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, the apostolic, the apostolic, that just became like over and over kind of crazy. Um, so that was one warning sign. Um, now I would probably want to differentiate for people that, um, abusive church situations are not the same as what we we're talking about, the new apostolic reformation or NAR. They, they it's not like, uh, an abusive church that I, that I'm describing spiritual abuse. Uh, I mean, very controlling, manipulating, authoritarian, uh, don't question anything kind of environment. I'm not saying that if your church is like that, this is this is what I mean by NAR. What I mean is um, NAR mm-hmm. is the teaching of apostles and prophets being restored in places of high authority and uh, you know gaining new revelation. And now this is the what is how the church is moving moving forward in the future to achieve this end time uh, thing. Um, so, but what I feel uh, is my experience, and it may and it seems to be consistent is that this sort of structure where there's that sort of authoritarian, high authority, low accountability sort of structures are great environments for that sort of abuse to happen. So one, just because it's an NAR doesn't mean that, oh, it's abusive and terrible. And just because it's abusive and terrible somehow means it's an NAR, they can overlap or they can be separated. So I don't want people to think that just because you, oh, listen to Brian, he had a bad church experience, and now he needs someone to blame. He's going to blame the NAR and these teachings. Yeah. That's totally not the thing. Uh, you know, at the time, uh, I was questioning these things a little um, and accepting them and thinking, okay, I'm, I'm here for the ride because I felt like God sent me there. And uh, so who am I to question? Now, I had a hard time in that environment, and that made me think, you know, whew, man, do I, man, this is hard. Um, now it got to the point where, <laughs> yeah, this could be a warning sign. You know how, when someone, uh, talks to you and, you know, they're a counselor, they, they're supposed to ask you certain questions like, have you ever thought of self-harm? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I remember yeah. just dreading going in to work thinking, I- I'm never going to be able to leave this place. I am trapped here. This feeling of being hmm. trapped. And, and I don't know how many times where somehow in my mind, I thought, maybe the only legitimate way I could save face and not have to go in was if maybe an accident happened to me and then Hmm. uh, people wouldn't think bad of me for not going in, but I just don't want to go in, but I I can't be the person who's a rebel and who is weak. You know, there's crazy thoughts that go through your head when there's this, Hmm. well, this is God, but I'm pleasing man. I can't let anyone down. I have to perform, uh, you know, pull it up. You know, there's there's all kinds of things that happen in, in that sort of environment. It was my experience, but uh, I digress. Um, that that could be a warning sign. When you feel trapped, when you feel like you can't question, yeah. when the authority is there and boxing you in and it's like, you know, you're, you're going to do things this way, you know, uh, hmm. um, this is my way or the highway. Uh, that was a right. warning sign. There were... Was one of the... Just a tag team onto mm-hmm. that. Was did you have the idea that you're going to miss out because what's happening right here with with this group and this church with this leadership? You know, you've got a special covering or you're oh. in a special place where special mm-hmm. things are happening. And if you go anyplace else, 
you're going to have to start from scratch. You're going to lose everything. <clears throat> yes. Um, Something like that. You know, it seemed to be the case in... Now, I've been in three places which were what I would call uh, medium NAR, high NAR, and high NAR. <laughs> what I mean is one okay. was more hyper-charismatic, but not too off the rails. Um, then the other one was hyper-charismatic and, and hyper-prophetic. And then the other one was finally getting into the apostolic crazy. Um, so in all those environments, the mentality that was absorbed was uh if you're not at this place uh you are not in the move of god we are at the cutting edge and ev any other church those are dead churches any criticism that comes mm -hmm. from outside is a demon naysayers fault finders cessationists they don't believe you know it's like those are uh we don't want to go to dead churches those are dead churches Seminaries were referred to as cemeteries because they're just dried cemeteries. up teaching. Yep. So these were this is like the mentality that you absorb if you're in that environment long enough where experience and making the Bible say something new every Sunday or Thursday or Tuesday hmm. or every Saturday because you have to be at every single event or what's wrong with you? <laughs> you know, we lived um, 10 minutes from the beach for six years. And we went there for enjoyment and fun. I'm, gu I'm, I'm guessing we must have been there two or three times. But, you know, Southern California is beautiful. But we, I was worked to death to the point where, wow. you know, um, you, the only time you'd kind of escape that was um, going on a family holiday or, you know, going, going to visit family. And that was its own sort of experience because it be careful, make sure you keep praying strong because everybody's family's got demons. They're go to dead churches. They don't understand. Uh, they don't understand mm. the prophetic. Um, you know, make sure you go cast out devils, <laughs> you know, don't bring back any demons, you know, when you, when you visit your family. Um, wow. So any outside sort of influence was, it was just kind of like, well, we know that they don't get it. They wouldn't get it. They're from a dead church. They're they're blind. Um, blind yes. Pharisees. Can I can I interject? Mm -hmm. What what you're describing is a thought control cult. Yeah. And I don't <laughs> I don't remember if we talked about this when we did our other interview, but I you know my wife and I in the late '90s were in Amway. Mm-hmm. And there are so many parallels. Uh, I I wrote an article when I was just a blogger ten years ago. I wrote an article called "When Did the Church Become Amway." Yeah, and it's been read hundreds of thousands of times. It was, I think, my most popular article because I showed all the things that were the same. But that idea that we are part of this special group and we know things that other people don't know, and if anybody criticizes us, well, it's because they're the others. They're the people that don't know what we know, mm -hmm. and there's no way that they could understand us because they're not part of us. Mm -hmm. And so there's this. It's a kind of a thought loop, and you got to somehow get out of that that bubble. And say, well, wait a minute, if what they're saying is biblical and true, wouldn't it make sense that other churches around the world would also be saying those same exact things? Yeah. Why, how, is this, how is this a healthy thing that God somehow caused this one church that I'm a part of to be the only place where I could actually be fed properly and actually yeah. praise God? And, yeah. and yet I feel like I'm trapped in a cult at the same time? Hmm, that's a, yeah. Yeah. Y you that, know, uh, when, we were, oh, when, we were in Am when we were in Amway, they had, they had tapes and uh, books, well, it turned from tapes into CDs, and functions or meetings. That was called the system. Mm -hmm. And you had to read the books, you had to go to the meetings, and you had to listen. Every week, you had to listen to a number of speeches from the leaders telling you all the things that kept you inside of this thought bubble. Yes. And I got out of that thought control cult because I was fed up with all the bad results that are business had there was no results we were broker than ever four years into it we had lost tons of money we lost everything or a lot of things and i said you know i am not going to listen to a tape this week i'm not gonna listen to anything just for a week i'm gonna yeah. see what happens and it was like the clouds broke and the sun rays started shining through <laughs> and it, it was only, it only took a couple of weeks of not listening to the materials that i realized 
I don't want to do this anymore. And it doesn't work and it never mm -hmm. has worked. Everything they told me was not true, but you had to break away just enough to get an outside viewpoint, an, an objective yeah. outside viewpoint from somebody who could, who gen, genuinely wanted to help you. Yeah. You know, and maybe that was even yourself, you know, like, like you have these two yeah. things in your mind. Mm -hmm. One part is saying, I, I don't want to be here. And I feel like my life would be better if I was gone. But the other half says, no, no, you can't do that. You've been here all this time. And, you know, all your friends are here and what are, what'll they say about you? And it'll be embarrassing. There's all yeah. these things that cause you to stay in that thought bubble. At one point, my remember having a conversation with my wife and it went like this. She says, you know, Brian, um, I think we're in a cult. And I said, no, we're not in a cult. <laughs> and she says, why aren't we in a cult? My cult leader told me so. Why aren't we in a cult, Brian? <laughs> and I said, because I don't want to be in a cult, wow. you know, but, uh, at, wow. And, uh, you know, here's, here's the crazy thing. I, I remember, and you know, the book 1984, I, I was reading it and I was like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, I'm being controlled. <laughs> uh, there were huh. certain like things that broke through the cl clouds. And, uh, one, one funny thing that relates to that was, uh, I think I put it in a note to you at one point, but um, I remember being in a staff meeting with the apostle and the and the staff. And I'm a drummer, so I know musical terms and tempo and rhythm. Well, the apostle said, and I don't recall it exactly. I just remember that he misspoke, replacing one term with the other. And I corrected him and I said, no, no, uh -oh. you're talking about tempo, not rhythm. Because he was trying to uh, apply this metaphor to what we were doing. We have to find a new mm. tempo. And I said, no, I think what you mean is rhythm. And then there was a back and forth. And then I had to, you know, bow the knee, so to speak, and let him use the wrong term. And uh, then I remember his assistant taking me aside after that meeting. How dare you contradict the apostle? And I said, but he was wrong. Mm. I mean, he was factually wrong. It doesn't matter. Right. I said, he, that's what he said, doesn't matter. I said, what if he says two plus two equals five? He, should I say yes? And he says, yes. And I was like, wow. whoa. And, and along that line was like, remember how I said I was a graphic designer? Every year we would have an anniversary conference. And so um, for the conference, I would have to put up some graphics. And so five had some spiritual meaning six was spiritual meaning so you'd name the and that was the theme for the year so seven was like perfection or eight was you know new beginnings and all this sort of stuff so 11 <laughs> came around and i said okay so and so um what's the theme for 11 he's like just start, get started on the graphics we can make it mean whatever we want it to mean wow. <laughs> i was like no, no, it's, it's stuff like that. Like it was, it was always happening. Yeah. And, and the more it happened, it was like, wait, this is like living in a dream world. What am I doing here? I'm getting work so hard and this is nonsense. And I'm saying things mm -hmm. that are highly questionable. Like, oh man, I, I mean, I'm not going to go into the moral issues because I don't think that's appropriate. Um, but. Well, but you haven't told us. The name of the church okay. at all. Yeah. So. Well, the, um, yeah. Well, things that break families and uh, are that sort of degree of uh, immorality was happening and covered up in very public ways mm -hmm. with blatant lies. Um, okay, so stop for a second. Yeah. I want to I bring something up because yeah. you're going to be the perfect person to describe something. I have a really good friend. His name is Steve. Yeah. And uh, Steve, if you're watching, you're one of my best friends, you, but he already knew that. I had a conversation with him uh, 25, 20, about 25 years ago, and he was working at a big mega church. He was on staff, a minor position. He wasn't like a you know lead pastor or anything, but he told me how the lead pastor of the church would say things in front of the audience on Sunday morning to the effect of, well, I don't know if the... Uh, if the board is going to go along with this, but I really think we ought to blah, blah, blah. And he would make it sound like he was really pushing for this thing that God told him to do. But, you know, I don't know if they're going to approve this. And Steve told me, the guy does whatever he wants. There's nobody stopping him. Mm -hmm. All the people 
on the board are all yes men that he approved of ahead of time. Yeah. So he's just playing this role on stage, making it sound like there's a, a group who's deciding everything together. But in fact, he was a control freak who was just making it sound like he wasn't a control freak by pretending that there was a board of elders who would hold his feet to the fire if he went too far. And I had never considered the possibility until he told me this firsthand story of what he was seeing for himself in an actual church. Mm -hmm. And so you were on staff in a church and you saw what was being portrayed on a stage, controlled narrative, and then you knew what was actually happening that was true because you saw it behind yes. the scenes, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ex exactly. Um, now, there were certain things I, rumors, rumors I heard and I didn't believe it because I thought the pastor could never do such a thing. And I said, hey, so-and-so, huh. you know what? I heard someone say that blah 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 pastor did this. And uh, I was like, isn't that the stupidest thing? Why would this person believe that? And uh, this person must have had been in more in the know than me because he, he was black, but he turned white. <laughs> and uh, I thought that was uh, odd. And only... Um, only indirectly did I happen to find out, and in such a way, I don't know if you ever see the movie The Usual Suspects, where, you know, all the different, um, there's this guy who makes up a whole story, and he's just coming up with it, with all these, like, things on the investigator's back wall. And then, the, you know, the guy who was being interviewed leaves, and, and then the man stands up, and he's holding this coffee mug, and... He starts staring at the wall and realizes the entire story's been told. The entire story that he has been told has been woven together using fictional people pulled from the names of news articles and stuff on the back of the wall where he was sitting at. And in that mm. moment, it all comes together and all the docs connect and you realize he's been duped. And his, he drops the coffee mug and it shatters on the floor in slow motion. It was that sort of feeling. It was like, huh. oh, all of these dots have been accumulating and you're just staring at this now oh, this means nothing and then suddenly the picture jumps out and you see oh, now i know why everything has gone this way it's all to cover this up and it's all to make this and this person was really doing this and this person isn't the bad guy they're the good guy and they were thrown under the bus so um yeah there was there's just um high uh, authority hmm. with zero accountability um the apostle can do no wrong in certain vent, you know environments that that operate this way and um if there is moral failure that's okay they're just going to go through a quick month or two of re restorative uh, repenting and humbling themselves and saying the right thing and then they're back in the circuit um you know hmm. because they're a their apostle buddies are going to mentor them and hold them accountable from across in Florida, you know, or wherever. Now, I'm I'm just kind of shooting from the hip in my commentary there. But uh, let me be more, more sharp. I'm not describing every church. I'm not describing what NAR inevitably leads to. Um, I'm not saying this is every, every church uh, at all. And I hope nobody has to go through the sorts of things I went through. And I'm not bitter anymore. I've forgiven. Uh, I'm praying and I love the people who who have done me wrong and said lies. But I, this could not have happened unless that environment enabled it. Um, now, not no. necessarily NAR stuff only can enable this, but it certainly was a contributing factor. when. People who uh, speak for God are given that sort, you know, supposedly, supposedly speaking for God are given that sort of authority. Um, it can lead to really bad re results. So I, I don't want to say that this is what happens every time or, or say this is, oh, you're going to that China church. This must be happening in the background. Please don't take it that way. But say that, uh, let me just say that. I, I would hope this would be an encouragement to people who might be trapped in that sort of thing and they haven't realized it because I was, and mm -hmm. it took some sort of turn of events for me to snap out of the spell and to realize things. And the, go ahead and ask questions, go ahead and push back, go ahead and, mm -hmm. um, you know, 
buck against things that are not supported by Scripture and see what that response is. Don't just tolerate it. Don't get under that. Mm-hmm. And if and if you're pushed back, uh, you know, you're pushed down for pushing back, run away and find a different place. Yeah. That's a signal right. that you're in an abusive bully pulpit. And yep. as far as the teachings go, because there is the environment and then there's the teaching, there there's a different sort of filter, I think, to you know, that needs to be run. Not just what kind of an environment. Oh, I'm in a healthy environment. Okay, now let's look at the teaching. I'm glad your environment is healthy. Even though it maybe it's an NAR church, I'm glad that's a healthy one in the sense of maybe it's not abusive or a bully sort of controlling place. Now, yeah, right. let's look at the teaching. Is um, this enabling um, the scripture to be abused and used for whatever meaning that um, brings the hype that week? Are prophetic words bandied about and hyped up so much that it's just, uh, this is what you're there for? Do you come away understanding the scripture, um, the true plain meaning? And who is this letter written to? <laughs> you know, who, who wrote the letter? <laughs> what was the background in, you know, Jerusalem or the time or wherever it was written? Uh, what were the Hebrews going through when this was penned for them? If this is not part of what's being taught and it's more about your breakthrough and you know, mm-hmm. you've got a demon coming out of your ear or something, or you're <laughs> sc- screaming and rolling around on the floor. That's a signal to question, what am I being taught? Because you will not survive as a Christian <laughs> the long haul if you are not fed proper <laughs> food. You're living on mm-hmm. sugar. <laughs> it's just like sugar mm-hmm. and caffeine environment as far as the teaching goes. And you will burn yourself out uh, spiritually and get burned maybe somehow, or at least you're not, this is, if you could, if the devil could get you running around at a hamster wheel and rolling around in the floor, metaphorically speaking, then you're not really going to win souls for Christ by sharing them, sharing with them that Christ died for your sins, that you could be justified before a righteous God, you know, who's going to pour out his wrath on the ungodly. And he's rescued mm-hmm. from the rescued you from the dominion of darkness. So, I would just again differentiate between unhealthy environments, unhealthy teaching, and there are resources maybe we can point people to that uh, maybe we could suggest at the end that would be great for it's like okay, how do I deal with whether you know the nonsense I'm hearing uh, and the control I'm encountering, and then there are resources with how can I deal with the and discerning properly. How should I read my Bible? What are the rules of hermeneutics? What is good theology? Yeah. Um, how can I um, properly divide the word of truth and know if, if, if the preacher is using it right? You see, because Steve, when I was in the church, they're using the Bible. So you can't, right. but it's not good enough to say, well, he cited the scripture. He used 10 scriptures. Right. <laughs> he mentioned 10 <laughs> scriptures. He flashed them up and he read them. And yeah, but <laughs> that is not good enough. And there's reasons why that's not right. good enough. Um, because you can, again, like I said at the be- towards the beginning, this, you can make the Bible say whatever you want, especially to people who don't know that there are proper rules for reading the Bible. I want to go back to a, a thing that you said that I think is really um, it, it's a very revealing comment. And I want to dig in a little deeper. Because when your wife said, I think we're in a cult, Mm -hmm. and you said, no, we're not. And she said, how do you know we're not in a cult, I think? Mm -hmm. And, and, but your answer is so revealing. It's like a, it's like a whole seminar on why do people stay in cults? Because you said basically, because I don't want to, I don't want it to be a cult, right? Is that correct? Yeah. Or I don't want to be in that. That was what I said. Yeah. I said, uh, because I don't want it to be a cult. I didn't want to be so in a cult. So there's two things. You know, I, I was like, nobody does. You know, I don't, uh, nobody this does. can't be a cult because this is, how could that be? And and as part of it, and I'll let you talk there to elaborate, is when th- there are certain moments that shift your paradigm and you realize that, mm-hmm. okay, now I have to reinterpret all my experience here because this is not what I thought. 
and I got to backpedal and re-evaluate, rebuild, do the hard work of sorting sorting this out. Because it's really hard to just say, oh, I was wrong. Let me think the right thing now. <laughs> no, there's way more than that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that topic is actually... Um... Paulette and I are making videos, uh, not as many as we thought we would, but we're making videos for AGTV, which is the American Gospel app. And then we're also making those same videos for our Patreon page. And we just did one last month. And it was on this topic of there are actual um, categories that psychiatrists and sociologists have developed to explain a lot of these human behaviors. And they actually help us kind of categorize and give clarity to some of these things. But um, the idea that people really want to be comfortable, and one of the things that human beings have a tendency to do, and this this doesn't interfere with Christian beliefs at all, because as Bible-believing Christians, we believe that mankind has a problem of being sinful. We have a sin nature. Even after we're saved, we, have a, we mm -hmm. still have a struggle with our sin nature, and that sin nature does a lot of things over and over again that we're, we're never finished fighting against. And one of the things is we like to be right. We want to be the ones who don't have to apologize. We want to be able to say, yeah, we were we were right. And we also, just as a human thing, it's not even necessarily a sin thing. We just want to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. It's we, we're, we, we avoid uncomfortable situations and uncomfortable feelings in all sorts of ways. And if you have to say, you know, I've been going to this church and telling everybody about my church and inviting people to my church, and I've been on staff at this church even, or I've been, you know, volunteering at this church. And now I've got to do this incredibly uncomfortable thing. I've got to say to all the people at that church, I'm sorry, but I just don't agree with this anymore. I'm going to go somewhere else. And now to all the people outside of that church, when they find out you're not going there anymore, especially if you were on staff, that's even more uncomfortable. Like, oh, I, I, I left that church, and I don't even believe some of the stuff that was being taught at that church. It's almost easier for for people to just stay there because at least you're avoiding all those uncomfortable feelings and uncomfortable yeah. circumstances. And I think I think um one of the things that really I don't know if I want to say it helped me. I think it'd be better to say God used this foundational thing and that was in my mind I went through a bunch of difficult things about 12 years ago and I wasn't sure about Really, what do I believe? And we talked about this in the podcast I did with mm -hmm. you. And I kept coming back to, well, if I'm a Bible-believing Christian, I think that gives me my answer to a large extent. I don't need to feel bad about saying I'm, I'm going to leave this church because it's not that I have a personal problem with anybody, per se. And I didn't. You know, I still have friends that go to these churches. I really do. And I I, I never wanted to be a mean guy who was saying mean things about individual people. It was, I think this teaching is bad. Mm -hmm. And it's because now I'm spending more time comparing what's being taught to the Bible itself. And I think we should be able to say, you know, kind of apologize for the mistakes that we've made or apologize for the affiliations that we were so adamant about, you know, we were so passionate about, I know I'm on the right track. I'm going to this conference. I'm reading these mm. books. I'm listening to these CDs or whatever. Now we can say, you know what? I'm, I'm reading my Bible more than I used to. And I'm finding out that some of these ideas aren't as biblical as I thought they were. And I need to follow what God's word says. Yeah. And, you know, nothing personal. Mm -hmm. Like I remember um, I had a really interesting little, situation. This is about 10 years ago. I had a, a, a friend who had a polka band and he played <laughs> gigs basically for money. He was a very, very gifted accordion player. And he and his brother and one other guy had a trio and they were booked as a trio and the other guy couldn't make it. I think he actually played the banjo. And I said, well, I don't really know polka music, but I can kind of follow the chords if you just kind of tell me what key you're in. And so basically I just sat in a couple of times at this this place in Madison and somebody from our big charismatic church saw me up on stage and I didn't really know this guy because it was a big church and you know how you you don't really know people you just recognize their face and he was like hey you're the guitar player from such and such church aren't you and I said well yeah but I I don't go there anymore he's like what you don't go there anymore what happened I said oh I just I just don't agree with the theology and I remember just saying it very matter of fact I wasn't judgmental or, mm -hmm. or trying to offend him. I was just matter of fact. And I, I, I feel like almost God gave that little phrase to me because that was my way of saying nothing personal, 
but I can't go here anymore because the teaching is not biblical mm-hmm. enough for me. Yeah. Sorry. You know, and maybe that would cause that person to think, well, gosh, I never thought about that. Because like you said, ah, the pastor showed a bunch of Bible verses. He he referenced the Bible. That's not enough. Yeah. Maybe he's referencing in a way that's using really bad, uh, what we would call um, eisegesis. When yeah. you're pulling something out of the Bible that isn't there and making it sound like it says something that it doesn't really say. Yeah. Because you want to make your point. You're going to, you can find a verse about anything to make your point. And yeah. that's a... That's a big, a big mistake that a lot of people, you know, if you, and if you start with that very foundational thing that we began with, which is it's a, it, the head and the intellect is your enemy. Well, everything's out the window from that point forward. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. now there are no arguments. There are no discussions even. You're using your head. Aha. Charlie's using his head. Ignore Charlie. He's using his head. He's not using his heart like the spiritual people that we are. Well, the guy saying that just used an intellectual argument. It was a terrible intellectual argument, but nonetheless, it was thoughts and ideas being expressed intellectually to make a point that we shouldn't mm-hmm. be using thoughts and ideas intellectually. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it's it's amazing how dumb some of this stuff is, but it, it's a it's a lot of layers that have to get peeled back, yeah. isn't it? It's not just one or two things. It takes time. It yeah. takes a lot of peeling back. I encourage people to... Not feel ashamed that you don't know these things yet, or you don't quite understand what we're talking about, or, or you feel like, oh gosh, you know, I'm not as smart. So, so, so what? I wasn't that smart. I'm not. I'm still not that smart. It's not about being smart. It's about learning from good teachers and reading your Bible and seeing what the Bible actually teaches in context. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Now I went on my tangents. Since you went on so many of your tangents, we're hey, good at going on tangents. That's, that's what I, we're here for. Yeah. No, yeah. We we both went through a lot of the same sorts of things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one of the things you mentioned earlier was the idea that um, there are certain sort of ways of thinking that sort of make it impossible to get out of, you know, you know cult-like thinking where um, you know, anyone it, who would say otherwise is in the out group, so therefore they're disqualified. There's Maybe it's a, a couple of things that you could say it's an ad hominem thing where if you say, hey... I don't know if I uh, agree with um, this teaching on apostles and prophets because, um, you know, I was listening to this sermon by so-and-so and, oh, well, that person, they're a blank, you know, and fill in the Whatever the it is, it doesn't matter. As long as they're not part of they're us. They're a blank. Then we can just. Yes. Yeah. So, ad hominem, to the man, <laughs> arguing against the person or or you just believe that because the genetic fallacy where the just because Oh, you you just believe that because you had a bad abusive church experience. So you're saying that uh, the only reason I believe that it might have been the cause for me to investigate, but it's not the reason I believe the NIR is incorrect teaching. It's completely different. Mm -hmm. I could have left the church on great terms and later studied 10 years later and found out, hey, you know, this guy over here teaching this, this ain't in the Bible. So how I come to believe something is irrelevant. How my motivation for how I came for for what I why I believe something or why I'm communicating it is irrelevant. They don't you have to evaluate statements and teachings on their own merits, even if, a, you know, your worst enemy is saying it, they might be saying the truth or if it's your best friend, they might be lying. You have to evaluate the statement because you don't know. So these ad hominem responses that are so seem to be so common like, oh, they're a cessationist. Well, in any, anybody's watching right now, I am not a cessationist. I believe in the gifts of the Spirit, and I'm seeking to find out what is what do those things look like properly, and how should they be used in, in line with the Scripture? And that's my big concern, is that I'm honoring the Lord and the right expression of those things. And because of past experience, I'm trying to be very careful that I don't read those past experiences into the text. Oh, see this uh, falling in the falling in the church, for instance, falling down when you get prayed for. Oh, and then I read the Gospels where Jesus people come up to Jesus and they fall down when he says, I am he. Oh, you see, that's being slain in the spirit. No, it's not. But if I <laughs> read my experience into it, I could see that. So I'm trying to avoid those sorts of errors. But. Yeah, as you said, Steve, there's a lot of sorts of mindsets where the response is, I'm not going to address 
the counter argument against this teaching, and I'm going to protect myself by labeling the person who's bringing it. So I'm ad hominem. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say, you only believe that because, so it's a genetic fallacy, how you, how you came to believe that, or it's going to be uh, another sort of protection thing. You know, you've got a demon, <laughs> you know, you can always revert to that, you know? So, because we have this the straw bias. Man. There's a lot of, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's right. The, the idea that straw manning an argument as well. Like for instance, uh, I've, I've heard Todd White say, you know, those people that hate the Holy spirit. Right. I'm like, wow. Right. So it's either Todd White's viewpoint or the other people who all hate the Holy Spirit. Yes. Or they don't believe in the Holy Spirit. I, I'm i trying to find a Christian somewhere on planet Earth who doesn't believe in the Holy Spirit. Because <laughs> that, that, by definition, would be somebody who isn't even a Christian. All Christians believe in the Holy Spirit. Mm. So a straw man argument is where you don't argue the person's argument as it actually is, mm -hmm. you create a easy to defeat straw man. It's easy to knock down a straw man because they're so weak. Mm -hmm. So instead of saying, "Oh, I, 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 I listened to that Brian guy, and he actually had some really carefully thought through ideas about how to properly interpret this particular passage," you don't say that. You say, "Oh, that guy has just got a problem because he had a bad experience." Like you said, that's a that's a type of uh, logical fallacy. Or you say, "Well, he just doesn't like." The Holy Spirit anymore. Yeah. Well, no, that's that's a that's not what he said. That's what you said about him. And if that was true, it would be easy to make him out to be this bad person that should be just ignored from this point forward. But that's just a straw man. He he doesn't actually say any of those things. Yeah. And you know, we do these hit the bar videos, and honestly, we're 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 covering mostly very, very big popular pastors of giant churches. Occasionally we'll do somebody less known. But they're terrible arguments. I mean, unbelievably bad points that are being made by mm -hmm. these men. And, it, you know, when people say this is the end times and uh, the church has really gotten bad, I kind of like, yeah, <laughs> I can see why y y you're saying that, because it does seem that way yeah. in a lot of ways. On the other hand, I do study enough of church history to know that there's been other times where things were really bad mm -hmm. in other ways. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. so I, I don't know if this is the very end of the Christian church as we know it. And Jesus is about to return. That's fine. If he wants to return tomorrow, I'm, I'm totally, I'm totally good with that. Yeah. But in the meantime, I think we need to build up our faith. You know, we need to take our faith seriously and take the steps necessary to relearn things and to be willing mm -hmm. to say, gosh, I am, I'm, I'm a little embarrassed to admit, but yeah, I was wrong. I was fooled. I, I fell for this stuff. And you know what? I think it's okay for guys like you and me to say that because you know, we, we, we got through it. Yeah. You know, I, and, and it's, 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 it's okay to, that's part of the repentance process, I yeah. think is, is what I'm trying to say. Let me say a few things if I might about just sort of what I've gone through after, because, you know, I'm, I'm picking out various stories of which there, there are countless, you know, um, it's, it's interesting to recount and, but I don't want to dwell on, oh, look at the other crazy things. Uh, I, I would highlight those just to emphasize the seriousness and the extent that certain environments can take things, uh, certain um, bully pulpits or manipulating leaders can take, and how the teachings can become so skewed, and how if we're not discerning, we can get taken up with certain things without testing them against Scripture. And um, so... <sighs> There are certain process I went through where after I got out of the church, one of the things that helped me when I got out of that church environment, one of the things that helped me was, um, as I mentioned, hermeneutics. And that's a, you know, how do you interp properly interpret the Bible? And one book that helped me was called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth by Gordon Fee. And if someone's coming out of a charismatic background, Gordon Fee's continuationist. So you don't have to say, oh, well, he doesn't believe the right thing. So I, I'm not going to listen to him. He's a continuationist. So don't fear. Um, you know, I, I had to realize that I, uh, when I, I didn't need to figure out, well, is tongues right? Is prophecy right? Are all these extraneous things right? What I had to do 
was go back to the basics and find out what is the gospel, ground myself in the gospel hmm. and rest in the Lord and find my, my faith refreshed in that I'm saved and I don't have to do anything. Now, Lord, what, how can I serve you? Um, you know, my hands are set free from chains of this rabbit wheel, or, you know, this, this merry-go-round I'm on. Now I can serve you. Uh, out of thankfulness and a heart of service and r figuring out how to focus on things in the scripture. It, it, I had to learn to read the Bible uh, uh, the right way or a better way. And so learning a uh, proper interpretation of scripture and that there are principles for doing it, that book, how to read the Bible for all it's worth by Gordon Fee was very influential and helpful. Um, I think it's also important for people to read some systematic theology, and there are some good ones. I would point people to one that I like by Wayne Grudem. He's highly respected. Again, he's not a cessationist. Not that I have anything against cessationists. I think they're highly thorough, and I, I respect them. I uh, think the arguments are, are very good as well, um, but I'm just pointing out that these resources are not uh, cessationists so that it doesn't turn people off who are coming out of maybe a hyper charismatic environment. Nobody's saying that you need to ditch everything, all your practices and all your beliefs on every secondary tertiary issue. The point is, what is sound theology? What's a good way of thinking about doctrine? What's the right way for me to read the Bible and to go through that? I would also recommend people uh, Good points. People read some or listen to sermons that are not hype. Um, avoid sermons that speak and preach with at the top of their lungs as fast as they can, because you need to read slowly, mm -hmm. think carefully, and not get drawn into emotion when you're consuming and digesting the scripture, because they can slip anything in and. And, and a fast talker is just going to sell you an extended warranty, um, spiritually speaking. <laughs> so uh, I would say, listen to slow preaching and teaching. And I like Tim Keller lately. I think some of his teachings great. I finished his audiobooks about the book of Romans, and I've never, <laughs> I, I'm just so blessed by that. It's great. Um, resources <laughs> for the NAR stuff. I know. Stephen, you've you've got a lot of stuff, but also the books by Holly Pivik and Doug Guyvet mm -hmm. on the yep. teachings, and then discerning what are they actually teaching, what are the questions we might be asking about that. I think that's highly effective. Knowing why you believe and how to think better about what you believe, I would recommend an organization called Stand to Reason with Greg Kokel, str.org. So there's apologetics and good theological questions and careful thinking about your faith and giving reasons and thinking about cultural issues. And then here's a book. I'll hold the book up. It happens to be here. It's a book called Nonsense, a hand, handbook of logical fallacies. Now, since I got into apologetics, I've probably got five or six logic books and seven or eight critical thinking books, and they all are great. But this is one of my favorites because it just shows you all, categorically all of the different ways you can kind of go wrong in your thinking. And when you're made aware of it, you're like, oh, yeah. And then you see it everywhere. You have to be careful you don't become mm -hmm. a fallacy detective or the fallacy police. <laughs> unless, you're be, unless you're a fallacy police on your own thinking, that's number one. And then to be a critical thinker, not in a negative sort of, I'm going to criticize everything and find fault. No, it's like, I want to be discerning. I want to find truth. I want to be able to spot where I'm making the same mistakes and thinking, oh, it was an appeal to my emotions or, oh, you know what? They're, just, they're not making arguments. They're, they're making this fallacious appeal. You know, this is the misuse mm -hmm. um, fallacy, you know, some sort of fallacy. And there's another critical thinking book I, I like called Asking the Right Questions. Um, and if anybody wants any other resources, I'm sure they can reach out or, or whatever. But I just wanted to, maybe we'll talk some more, of Who's course. Who's the answer to that one? But um, yeah, 
I just wanted to make sure I got some of those recommendations in because studying those sorts of things are exactly what what I wasn't reading when I was caught up in hype, experience, working so fast and hard. Now maybe maybe not, nobody's in that same boat. Maybe they are, but um, you have to slow down and learn how to think different, learn how to read the Bible different, learn how to discern different, and it takes time. And that's the intellectual sort of spiritual study side. And if I might just say, there's the other side of, I had to go through a process of getting rid of unforgiveness and bitterness and offense Hmm. and disappointment and what have I done? And all I can say is like, I think the more, the most um, sort of progress I, I made in those areas was when I intentionally just figured, Lord, who am I holding unforgiveness against? Help me bring those to mind. And then praying for those people, forgiving them for anything I would hold against them. And I have to say, Steve, although I kind of remember things now, occasionally where I'm like, oh, I don't believe that person did that. There's no one where I, I, I could honestly say, there's no one that I think about and think, negative like vengeful um sort of Mm. i want something go wrong in their life sort of thoughts it's like no i've forgiven everyone and i've blessed everyone and i've prayed for everyone to be made made in the right place with the lord that they need to be and that did more for my healing than Mm. you know spiritually just as much as all those other intellectual things that help me to maybe think better and yeah. if you could only do one or the other, that might probably be the first, or, you know, the primary one. Um, otherwise, you may make, you know, you, you might get your thinking right and your heart be wrong, and that would be troublesome. And you might get your your heart right, but your thinking still wrong, and you might go through the same thing again. So I would want people to right. do both. But I just I just made a note of that stuff before we got on here because. I find I found value in that, and I don't want to just tell people a story about oh man it was terrible and NAR and meh. No, I, I I'm doing great, and you know what? In God's providence, He brought me through that. And I, I sometimes I second guess all the things that I've ever gone through, thinking did I really hear from God? I, I can't tell if I did or not. And then I just think, well, whether I heard from God, I am not sure, but I do know God is sovereign. And in his providence, he brought me through that. And there was a reason I was able to go through that because maybe I can help someone else going through a similar situation. And that's my prayer is that, um, you know, maybe I wouldn't understand grace the way I do now had I not gone through Mm -hmm. that. Maybe I wouldn't found apologetics and helped other people, you know, in that area through what I'm doing uh, if, if I didn't go through that. So, I would encourage people too not to think that they have lost something that you know the negative experiences the Lord is able to redeem them you know maybe that wasn't a, a um the ideal thing but God is a God of redemption in that sense so mm-hmm. nothing ultimately <laughs> what is that thing that Samwise Gamgee says are all the sad things going to be made right or be made unsad or mm-hmm. all the bad things are going to be made good again and that's kind of how i feel uh, uh, that god is a redemptive in that way you know well and this goes back to the theology of the cross if you've given up on this theology of glory which i highly recommend (laughs) um (laughs) then you're in a place to say you know what i did some really dumb things for a long period of time and it really on one hand seems like i wasted a lot of time and money Mm -hmm. and all these bad things happen and all these disappointments came in my life and yet like you just said, if we believe that God is sovereign, these things happened under his control. Mm-hmm. They happened in a way that on, on our side of heaven seems kind of random, but we can say, hey, you know, God's doing what he wants to do. Yeah. And praise God that I'm no longer part of that confusing movement that was such a burden. And I understand the gospel now, and I'm free from having to perform in order to, you know, make God pleased with me. Yeah. Um, 
Going back to another thing you just said that I, I think is really good, the idea of not having all this anger and bitterness towards the people that you were, you know, associated with and the, you know, people that maybe taught you things that weren't right. And um, the issue of us being right with God and and seeing things more clearly in the scriptures now is really the most important thing that, and I'm talking to the listener now, mm -hmm. it's really hard for some people to get over this issue of, yeah, but I have these friends and they're not listening to me. And why don't they listen to me? How come they're not, you know, getting out of that church like I did? They just won't let go of that. And I think this is where we have to go back to, well, if, if we do believe that God is sovereign, then I don't know what he's doing. And I don't know why they're still in that bad church. And I don't know why they're not listening to you. And you're sending them videos. Maybe you're sending them a a messed up church video and they're not watching them or they're watching it for two minutes and getting mad. And now they're not even talking to you. You know what? Let it go. That's between them and God. They have the same Holy Spirit. They have the same Bible that we do. And for whatever reason, they're not seeing things the way we would hope they would, but it's not up to you. The important thing is what, like you were just saying, forgive them, show love towards them, pray for them. And also don't feel like it's your responsibility to change them. I think is what I'm trying to say. Yes. Did I did I express that in a way that kind of relates to your oh, yeah. experience? Oh yeah, yeah. I think that um, you know, I, my experience has been that um, if someone tried to, at certain points where if someone tried to talk me out of it, it would in, only entrench me into it. Uh, you, you know, and, uh, and then there's times I've talked to different folks, and uh, I feel like I'm just uh, on a brick wall. And um, not to say you shouldn't, you know, plant seeds or put the stone in someone's shoe. I think mm -hmm. those things are helpful and we should be faithful and trying right. to convey truth. But if we're getting bent out of shape and then are either trying to win arguments or prove points or no, you're wrong and I'm mm -hmm. right. That sort of heart, negative heart behind it, mm, it's not going to help. <laughs> right. I think I think, yeah, that's I think that's the the. the that's kind of the core of what I was trying to get mm -hmm. at. Yeah. If we've been forgiven much, when we truly understand that we were sinners who were guilty before a holy God and Christ died in our place, our place, not the other guy's place, but our place, we're all in this together. We're all guilty before God. And so we, we have, um, we're not in a place to say, you know, gosh, I wish everybody would think exactly the way I'm thinking because I'm thinking correctly now. Yeah. I mean, what we really need to be saying is, I wish my friends could see what the purpose of the gospel really is the way I see it now. It's not about us doing great things in this lifetime and being great and having all this glory and, you know, being exactly like Jesus. It's it's about us saying, woe is me. I can't believe that in spite of my sin, Christ has loved me so much. He died for my sins. And he's given me eternal life. And and if I get to do a few great things in this life and I actually do have a little bit of success in some way, wow, that's even better. But even if I don't, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Because I, I know that I've been redeemed by Christ, who is the Redeemer. So, yeah, yeah I, I think this is a good place to stop. I, I, I really appreciate all your thoughts and I th appreciate your perspective. And I think it's going to be a really healthy thing for people to hear some of the... Um, and I wanted to ask you, the last book that you recommended, you didn't give the name of the author. Uh, Asking the Right Questions, A Guide to Critical Thinking by Neil Brown and Stuart M. Keeley. Uh, that would be that one there. And then the other one, the uh, Nonsense book, Logical or Handbook of Logical Fallacies, that's Robert J. Gula. Those are a handful of books that you can't not get some serious value and help from just in thinking clearer Good. and all of that. Yeah, I have a playlist. On, you know, I got a bunch of playlists on my web, uh, on a YouTube channel, and one of them is logical fallacies. So when I find yeah. good videos, I stick them in a playlist. And uh, logic is super helpful. Again, we're not saying that the whole Christian faith is all about logic. There's a mixture of us understanding things logically using our brains, and on top of that, the sovereignty of God and the Holy Spirit using the Word of God to teach us what is true. Yeah. And there's a there's certainly a mystery attached to that side of the of the coin. We're not saying that you you know. It's an intellectual exercise in and of itself. Mm -hmm. tell, tell me about your experience with Roberts Learden and the book God's Generals and how it had an effect on your life uh, and, and the influence of the NAR in your life. Sure. Um, well, I was just going to um, a church when I was an, a teenager, and uh, it was 
what you could call just a, a good charismatic church in the sense that, uh, and that's the way I saw it was it was uh, really an exciting preaching and motivational. And, um, you know, at the time I, I wasn't really thinking about uh, doctrine or anything. I was, I was more thinking about, you know, I want revival. Uh, um, revival was a big thing in my mind. Um, and I don't say that in a negative sense, by the way. Um, I was uh, a, a, a teenager on fire for God. And I was in an environment that was on fire. Uh, and, you know, quote unquote. And that was a great <laughs> time. And I have real good memories of, you know, growing up in that church and great music. And, uh, you know, I didn't have negative experiences. It, it, it was all positive, you know, it was all, and it was hype. <laughs> there was plenty of hype and there was plenty of, you know, making the scripture say something like, well, I never saw that was in that verse before. Wow, this is great. So, you know, the metrics that I was, I didn't see, I thought this is the greatest church ever. And we all did. So I liked it. I loved that. And um, nothing negative ever happened while I was going there. Later, it did. Um, but, um, you know, while I was going there in the church bookstore was a series of video cassettes by Robert Slearden called God's Generals. And because I was really intent on, you know, being on fire in my Christian school and wanting to, I, you know, I was really frustrated with people around me just being very nominal Christians and um, <laughs> just, you know, I was grieved. And I would get with my friends at lunchtime and we would pray, Lord, like, re revive this Christian school. It's supposed to be a Christian school, but man, what's going on? And so I had a lot of zeal, l less knowledge and, you know, but, you know, it was good. <laughs> it was a good time of, of, of seeing people getting excited for their Christian lives and, and influencing others around me and things like that. And so these books by, or these series by Robert Slearden really appealed to me because it was all about revivalists and reformers. And look at these great men of God who have made such a difference. Look at these great revivals of the past. Sort of the thing that was looked at, why did they succeed? And why did some of them fail? And what can we learn? And that intrigued me. And at the time, Robert Slearden was like, wow, this guy's a young man. He's seen heaven. <laughs> He's written a book, I Saw Heaven. And, um, you know, it's, it sold lots of copies. <laughs> now, I thought that, it was, he must be awesome because he saw heaven and I, who'd make that up? I mean, we would be that stupid to <laughs> lie to people. You know, I was so innocent in many ways that I could, I would never imagine that someone would be, have the audacity <laughs> to lie about something like that. So it had to be true, you know? And so, um, I thought, well, this guy is really hearing from God. And he talks about how he prays in tongues like, you know, hours a day and, you know, the Lord visited him and showed him heaven and all this stuff. So, and he studied the great generals. It kind of reminds me now of certain uh, motivational teachers and uh, gurus who be like, I studied the lives of successful people. I'm going to show you their 12 ways that they got rich and uh, yeah. you know, don't make the same mistakes <laughs> they did. Well, this is sort of what it was like. This was like um, that sort of thing for you know, being like hyper spiritual person, you know, he had books like the price of spiritual power, where he talks about, you know, how well his, all his friends were out playing baseball. He was in praying in tongues for hours and hours, crying out to the Lord to use him. And, you know, and everybody made fun of him, but now look where he is. He's a prophet. He's traveled every nation of the globe preaching the gospel. And I thought, well, you get a sacrifice, you know, what good does it profit a man? You know, uh, you've got to live for the Lord. And all I cared about, I want to do the Lord's will. I want to do the Lord's will. I, I would do the same thing. I would walk around my room and pray in tongues. And, and, I, and you know, um, I didn't know or think anything wrong with that. I, I suppose if I was giving my past mm -hmm. self advice, I'd want to take all that zeal and guide it and, and give it wisdom and harness it because it was pure mm -hmm. and it was great and it was energized. And, and God was using me in my ignorance in various ways. And so as I was watching these videos, he would describe, um, you know, great man of God, John G. Lake, 
you know, Smith Wigglesworth, you know, he was everybody's favorite. You know, he he drop kicked a baby and it got healed, you know, that sort of a thing where these stories were outlandish. And you're like, wow, this these stories are so amazing. Look at people were lined up in tents getting healed and they had this sort of gift and that sort of gift. And here's what they did to get, you know, this power in, in a way. It was like, hey, if you want the result. Here's what these guys did. You do it and you'll have the same mm -hmm. result. So at that time, having this mindset of, I just want to serve God. And the only thing that matters is me doing the will of God. Why would I want to do anything else? Why would I want to be a dentist? You know, um, God, you tell me what I'm supposed <laughs> to do and I'll do it. You know, so I was willing. I went on a couple of mission trips and was like, this is the only thing that's lighting my fire. Uh, maybe it's missions. You know, what do I do? And so this back of all of Robert Slayton's books, which I was consuming, like, you know, candy uh it was this advertisement <laughs> for his bible college oh you can be like a spiritual green beret we're raising up the next generation of revivalists and reformers come to our southern california campus and you'll learn from the great you know speakers and stuff and i was like dude that'd be awesome <laughs> you know you know i'm a green i was i was into 80s action movies so i want to be like delta force is a Christian, you know? <laughs> and uh, so show me the, just you show me where to point the, the gun, you know, kind of a thing. So um, I was praying and praying, like, what should I do, Lord? Uh, everybody else is picking colleges. And I have no idea. And the guidance counselor, I don't know what he's smoking, but the choices he suggested are silly. And I want to do <laughs> the will of God. And so I said, I'm going to talk to the pastor here. Uh, my church and say, Hey, you know, maybe I feel like maybe I should do missions. Maybe that's what God's calling me to do. And, uh, you know, maybe this Bible college, Robert Slearden's Bible college, uh, this one, I, I was like, Hey, secretary at the church, I want to talk to the pastor and figure out what my, what God's will is, you know? And, uh, so there was a church service and, um, there was a big, offering that was being given and stuff and then it was like oh people who are giving money come up and and uh and you know, things happen like that and and then it was prophecy time and oh i was called out and the prophecy was you're gonna go you have a missionary call in your heart and you're gonna go to that bible college and god is sending you there i got a i got a letter in the other day with a brochure to that bible college this is for you uh, I knew you, you wanted to talk about this, but today I got that flyer and this prophecy is for you and that you're going to change the nations. Huh. So, and, and, uh, and he says, no, I know normally prophesy people to a form a foreign field, but you know, this is what you're going to do in the nations. So that set me on the course and that was persuasive to me. I remember the next day, I mean, that was a real high getting that prophecy that I was going to go to this Bible college and I was going to be a missionary. Now, thinking back, what if a preacher told my kid and prophesied that they're going to do this or that? Well, I don't know how I'd feel about that, but at any rate, I was convinced. And I remember people saying, well, you know, you really think that that's the thing to do? And even some people in the church were like, uh, maybe you should think about this. And I was like, no, no. Uh, you know, I felt that in my spirit. And um, mm -hmm. unless someone comes along and makes me feel that in my spirit again, that say, no, then I got to do it. That's why I'm kind of hesitant when I think, you know, that uh, experiences have authority over wisdom sort of principles of weighing a lot of inputs. Not to say you can't receive a, a prophecy and, and judge that and use it as part of your inputs and then get godly counsel. But I don't think I would have done things the same way. And, but there I went a pilgrimage across from Michigan to California, uh, at 17 oh. to go to the Bible college. And there I did not learn hermeneutics there. I did not learn how Bible background. I didn't learn biblical history. It was, it was basically like everyday church service at an NAR church because there was prophesying, mm -hmm. there was, Casting out demons and 
and shouting and praying for hours and hours. And I mean, there were some tests here and there, but mostly it was reading, you know, word of faith books and <laughs> Kenneth Hagin type things and all the different yeah. local folks that were associated with Robert Sleard and were, were involved with teaching that. And uh, <laughs> yeah, they were not qualified to be instructors in in the sorts of topics mm. they were teaching and it and it was styled as a boot camp sort of a thing and it underwhelmingly equipped me to go to the mission field and so yeah um <laughs> i didn't have very much knowledge after that i had a lot of experiences and saw a lot of people leave that and get burned through that and Hmm. Uh, anyone who's followed Robert Slearden uh, or seen him, what he's done and things he's been involved in, he had his own issues. And um, no, I don't recommend that ministry uh, or that. I don't think the Bible college is there anymore, but I've since long hmm. gone from that, you know. Um, but yeah, this idea behind all of this was. Um, I, how do I find the will of God? Oh, it's through some sort of experience. It's through some sort of word. It's from some uh, external authority telling me the message of God. Mm -hmm. There was no, let's find out what what's my long-term goals are. Let's find out what, what sort of skills I want to have or future or what education do I need to open certain doors? There, there was, there was none of that. And, and it's really mm -hmm. um, baffling to me. <laughs> that I turned out all right, you know, through that. But um, <laughs> I think I did anyway, <laughs> uh, you know. Anyway, that's a big, that's big long rambling. But um, yeah, that's my experience with yes, Robert Slearden. And, and you saw at least some of the videos that me and Dan Long have made on what a terrible historian Oh yeah, he is. And yeah. those books are so useless. And this is a really good opportunity for me to announce that uh, I know some of the viewers have heard me talking with Dan about possibly doing a book together, and we're finally in the middle of working on it. And it's it's a specific goal to have that done by the end of this year, 2023. And it will show how bad some of the history is in the God's Generals books. And it, it will go further than that, though. It'll really show the real story behind uh, specifically Charles Parham. Uh, John Alexander Dowie, John G. Lake, and Frank Sanford. So maybe when that book is out, uh, we'll we'll talk again. Yeah. After you have a chance to go through it, because I think, you know, you were in the thick of the false narrative of the revivalist NAR stuff that still is a huge influence today, and it really bothers me that we have a new generation every so often of young people who are being told you got to be like John G. Lake. You know, mm -hmm. you got to do the things that he did. He didn't even do those things. They're all stories. Yeah. Yeah. And it just wears people out. And it, a lot of times they lose their faith because they're like, I'm not ever going to be as good as these people. And I'm sick of trying. I'm sick of people telling me that, you know, such and such is going to happen and it doesn't happen. It, it really is a destructive movement. Yeah. And, but by the grace of God, go you. And by the grace of God, have gone me. And so it's not hopeless. It's just um, it's important for us to to point these things out to people. So thank you again for being on the show. Thank you for all of your thoughts and ideas and your experiences and being so open and sharing about it. And let's do this again uh, sometime in the coming year, Brian. Yeah, definitely. Thanks so much for having me on the show and the program and uh, all the best as you go forward with this book as well. You can see, have some grace writing it. So thanks, Brian. We'll talk again soon. Bust out!